Hey there, friends. Rob Franick. I'm Editor-in-Chief here at the Princeton Review. And today, folks, we are sharing the top eight AP Biology concepts that you'll need to master come exam day. Let's not delay. Let's jump right in. Concept number one, folks. It is the chemistry of life. Now, this will constitute for between 8 and 11% of your overall exam. And as you might expect, the AP Biology exam will test your understanding of the chemical basis of life. This includes your understanding of essential elements and their subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and the ways in which they combine to form chemical compounds and create chemical reactions. You should also know about hydrogen bonding and the versatile properties of water, such as cohesion and adhesion, surface tension, and of course that all-important water's high heat capacity. You're also very, very likely to see a question on pH. So be sure to understand the relationship between hydronium concentrate, uh, hydronium ion concentration, pardon me, as well as the pH scale, as well as how the reactions are influenced by whether the solution that they incur in is acidic, basic, or neutral. It's also essential to understand the four important organic um, macromolecules. And in biology, those are, of course, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. They are all, of course, macromolecules, and all of them are polymers, which are the chains of building blocks called monomers. So it is crucial, my friends, that you understand in detail how monomers bond together to form polymers. And that leads us to concept number two, which is all about cell structure and function. Now, this will account for somewhere between 10 and 13% of your overall exam. And as you may already know, all living things are composed of cells, and those cells are the smallest unit of living organism that can carry out the activities necessary for life. So in preparation for the exam, you should understand the two distinct types of cells, prokaryotic, of course, and eukaryotic cells. Now, prokaryotes, like bacteria, do not have a nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotics do have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, so be sure to study the function and the structure of both cell types. It's also, my friends, to understand the vital role that the membrane plays in controlling the exchange of material with the cell's external environment. So be sure to review the concepts of membrane permeability and membrane transport. And while you're at it, we're just gonna add it to the list. Be sure to review the different types of cellular transport, including simple diffusion, facilitated transport, active transport, you know all of these, bulk flow, um, endocytosis, dialysis, and of course, last on the list is exocytosis. That leads us on to concept number three, which is cellular energetics. Now, this will account for between 12 and 16% of the exam. Folks, in order to carry out the processes necessary for life, cells are able to release energy when they need it and store it away when they don't. This is accomplished by the process of bioenergetics, which is the study of how energy from the sun is transformed into energy in living things. So you'll need to master the concept of how cells capture and use energy, which includes understanding how chemical reactions are catalyzed by enzymes and the ways in which the environment plays a role and how enzymes perform their function. Friends, I'm just gonna say it out loud, you should also have a deep, deep understanding of photosynthesis, the process by which plants use energy from sunlight to make, sh make sugar. And let's also remember that the College Board, the creators of all things AP, will also test you on cellular respiration, the process by which glucose is oxidized to produce ATP. Now, there are five processes in all involved in cellular respiration. Number, number one, which is um, glycolysis. Number two, the formation of acetyl coenzyme A. Number three, oh, and that's via the PDC. Number three is fermentation itself. Number four, the Krebs cycle. And number five, oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, these, you should, of course, be acquainted with each stage of those five processes by exam day. And last but not least, you should also know which processes are aerobic, which means requiring oxygen, and anaerobic, not requiring oxygen. Now, 
Glycolysis itself and form, uh, fermentation are anaerobic. Everything else is aerobic. Next up, my friends, is glorious concept number four, which is cell communication and the cell cycle. Now, this will account for somewhere between 10 and 15% of the exam. Now, sometimes cells do not pass molecules through the membrane, but instead they just pass a message. Now, this is known as signal transduction, whereas an, a ligand binds to a receptor on the outside of the cell and causes changes to the inside of the cell. Common examples of this are ligand-gated ion channels, catalytic receptors, and of course, G-protein coupled receptors. Now, this exam will test your knowledge of how cells communicate with one another, so you'll need to fundamentally, my friends, understand, number one, how cells generate and receive signals. Number two, how they coordinate mechanisms for growth. And number three, how they respond, of course, to environmental cues. You'll also need to study the various phases of the cell cycle, which are divided into two periods, interphase and mitosis. Now, this includes understanding the three different stages of interphase, G1, G2, and the S phase. And this also includes understanding the four stages of mitosis or cellular division. Now, that's the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase. Now, during prophase, the nuclear envelope disappears and chromosomes condense. In the metaphase, chromosomes align at the metaphase plate and mitotic spindles attach to connectochores. Next, in the anaphase, chromosomes are pulled away from the center. And finally, in the telophase, it terminates mitosis as the two new nuclei form. Now, without question, you should know both periods of the cell cycle interface in the mitosis in detail come test day, my friends. But we can't stop there. Let us move on to concept number five, which is heredity. Now, this covers between eight and 11% of the exam. And in its simplest form, genetics is the study of heredity. Now, it explains how certain characteristics are passed from parents to children by genes which are found on chromosomes Every organism, my friends, has a certain number of unique chromosomes. For example, fruit flies have four chromosomes, dogs have 39 chromosomes, humans have, of course, 23 chromosomes. Much of which we know about genetics was discovered by the monk Gregor Mendel in the 19th century. So expect to be tested on his findings and the fundamentals of genetics. This means understanding the definition of traits, of genes, of diploid versus haploid cells, of alleles, and uh, of uh, homozygous and heterozygous organisms, to name just a few, my friends. There are also three very important laws in uh, Mendelian uh, genetics. One, the law of dominance. Two, the law of segregation. And number three, the law of independent assortment. You should know all three cold come test day. And you should also review the non-Mendelian genetics, which refer to a situation in which traits do not follow or violate Mendel's laws. Examples will include uh, incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and polygenetic inheritance. Uh, inheritance pardon me. Lastly, you should know how to understand or how uh, you understand chromosomes transmit genetic information from one generation to the next through meiosis. Now, meiosis involves two rounds of cell division, meiosis one and meiosis two. You should know what takes place during meiosis one and meiosis two in detail and how the two processes are different from one another. Also, my friends, important to remember are pedigrees. Now, pedigrees are visual representations of a family's ancestry and are commonly used to depict the heredity of a specific trait or disease. This will also be pertinent in the AP Biology exam to know how to read pedigrees and how to solve pedigree-related FRQ. Next up is concept number six, which is gene expression and, of course, regulation. Now, this will constitute for between 12 and 16% of, uh, of the overall biology exam. Now, from the simplest single cell organism to the largest mammal, all living things possess an astonishing degree of organization as a result of their G DNA. Now, DNA is the genetic material of the cell. And as you prepare for this exam, it's essential that you understand its molecular 
structure. This includes understanding the subunits of DNA called nucleotides and how each nucleotide has five carbon, sugar, a phosphate, and one of four nitrogenous bases. Um, and that's number one is adenine, next is guanine, uh, the next is uh, cytosine, and the last one is, of course, thymine. Now, nucleotides themselves can link up in a long chain to form a single strand of DNA, and each DNA molecule consists of two strands that wrap around each other to form a long and a twisted double helix. Next, my friends, it is important to understand uh, the genome structure itself, and of course, all the DNA in the cell is the genome. It is divided up into chromosomes, which are divided into genes and each encode a particular genetic recipe. Now, chromosomes contain the recipe for all the processes necessary for life and have the ability to pass themselves and their information onto future generations as seen in the process of DNA replication. Speaking of which, you should have an in depth understanding of the steps involved in DNA replication. You should also understand transcription and translation. Now, transcription occurs in the nucleus and involves making an RNA copy of a bit of DNA code and it is completed in three, oh, pardon me, three phases, initiation, elongation, and of course termination being the last one. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm and it is the process by which the mRNA is translated into a protein. You may also come across questions related to the regulation of gene expression. So be sure to review the various times at which gene regulation can occur, as it can occur pre-transcripturally, and of course you guessed it, post-transcripturally, which is also referred to as post-translationally. Now, gene regulation is dynamic, and can either increase or decrease because of gene expression or RNA levels or protein levels themselves according to the needs of the cell. You'll also, of course, need to understand mutations and how they are formed as a result of the changes to the DNA or the mRNA. Friends, mutations can be small as soon as seen in single nucleotide swaps, or they can be large as when big chunks or entire chromosomes are swapped or duplicated or deleted outright. And finally, you should be familiar with biotechnology, including recombinant DNA, polymerase, a, a chain reaction, which that acronym is PCR, transformation of bacteria, and gel electrophoresis. Next on the list, my friends, is concept number seven, which is natural selection. Now this accounts for between 13 and a whopping 20% of the exam. Now, evolution can be described as a change in a population over time. And changes in the population occur through what is known as natural selection. Much of which we now know about natural selection is through the work of the 19th century British naturalist, of course, Charles Darwin, who sailed around the world aiming to understand why similar animals in different areas had different traits, and he placed his theory of natural selection in the book entitled On the Origin of Species. And friends, you can bet that the AP exam is most certainly going to test your knowledge of his observation and, of course, his findings. So, in a nutshell, this is what you must know. Number one, each species produces more offspring than can survive. Number two, offspring compete with each other for limited resources. Number three, organisms in every population vary. And number four, the offspring with the most favorable traits are most likely to survive and reproduce. You should also review the evidence of evolution itself, including fossils, uh, biogeography, embryology, comparative anatomy, and of course, molecular biology. Oh, and last on the list, uh, continuing evolution itself. Now, this evidence provides scientists with a good handle on how the evolution of a certain species occurred, which by the way, all comes down to, you know it, common ancestry. As such, you also should aim to understand how scientists use charts called uh, phylogenetic trees and cladograms to study relationships between organisms and track common 
ancestry. You should also study the causes of evolution. Now, evolution requires genetic variation and an environmental pressure that gives some individuals an advantage which permits survival and reproduction in a varied population. There are also key causes of natural selection that you should be familiar with, including random mutation, adoption, sexual selection, and of course, genetic drift. And finally, my friends, you need to understand the all-important hardy Weinberg law, which says that a population will be in genetic equilibrium and can be described by the equations uh, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1 and p plus q equal 1. Only if it meets these five conditions. Condition number one, a large population. Condition number two, no mutations. Condition number three, no immigration or emigration. Number four, random mating. And number five, no natural selection. And friends, last but not least is concept number eight, which is ecology itself. Now this is somewhere between 10 and 15% of the overall exam. And this last concept deals with how organisms interact with their environments. So for the AP Biology exam, you'll have to know a bit about different types of behavior, including instinctual behavior, learned behavior, and of course, social behaviors. Now, there are also plant-specific behaviors that you should be familiar with, known as tropisms, uh, and which there are three basic types of tropism, phototropism, gravitropism, and tigma tropism. That's a favorite of ours here at the Princeton Review. You'll also, of course, need to understand the principles of ecology itself. While biology it spends a lot of time on individual organisms, ecology studies the interactions between living things. Now, there is a hierarchy within the world of ecology and each level, the biosphere, ecosystem, community, and of course, population represent different levels of ecological interaction. And let's Review them, friends, because by you're sure to get them on the exam first. You should know that the largest unit is the biosphere that can be divided, can be divided into, into large areas called biomes, which include tundra, taiga, uh, temperate, deciduous forests, grasslands, deserts, and of course, last on the list are tropical rainforests. Now, folks, each biome can then be broken down into ecosystems, which are self-contained regions that include both living and non-living factors. Now, ecosystems are made up of communities, and a community refers to a group of interacting plants and animals that show some degree of interdependence. Now, within a community, you should understand the levels of the food chain, which consists of three main roles. The producers are the autotrophs, number two, the consumers are the heterotrophs, and number three, and you know this one well, called decomposers. Now, there's the smallest <laughs> unit of ecology, which is population. Now, population ecology is the study of how populations change. So you should understand related concepts such as population growth and carrying capacity, along with knowing the exponential growth and logistic growth equations. You should also have a general understanding of ecological secession, which refers to the predictable procession of plant communities over decades or centuries. And lastly, you should understand the ways in which humans have unfortunately disturbed the existing ecological balance. The human impact on the planet includes the greenhouse effect, the ozone depletion, acid rain, deforestation, pollution itself, and that is just to name a few, my friends. Folks, as always, we hope that uh, you enjoyed watching this video and found it helpful today. If so, please do give it a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comment section below. We read all of them. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already for the latest updates on standardized tests and college admission and extracurricular activities and study tips and much, much more. Rob Franick, Editor-in-Chief here at the Prince Review, signing off for today, folks. Be well.